So today, my guest on Matt Love's camera is, is a very firm favorite in film photography circles. It is, of course, live from Ohio, Dave Mahali, the old camera guy. How are you, Dave? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Matt? I'm very, very well. Now, we were just talking in the, in the pre-show warm-up about how, how cold it is over there in January. Uh, what, what's the current sort of uh, weather situation there? So we're lucky if we make it into the 30s. Uh, tomorrow, we're getting a wintry mix. So we'll have, if it gets above 32, maybe rain. Yeah. Uh, definitely getting some snow, some flurries, probably some ice. Yeah. And overnight, it's going to be uh, hopefully in the 20s. I hope it doesn't get into the teens, but we'll see. That's, That's Fahrenheit, chilly. of course. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty chilly. It's got, I think it's in the 80s here today uh, in uh, Fahrenheit. It's probably about 30 Celsius, but it's all like overcast and windy. And it's it doesn't really uh, make very good uh, photography conditions here at the moment with uh, the crazy kind of summer weather we're getting. So uh, let's talk about your channel. We're going to kick things off and we're going to talk about your channel, but we've also got some other questions. We're going to talk about, um, you know, frugal film choices, frugal camera choices. Uh, we will mm -hmm. touch on the frugal film project. We'll chat about Pentax's new camera. I think I haven't uh, pre-warned you about that one, um, mm -hmm. but we're going to start off uh, and we're going to start about your, your channel, your YouTube channel. You recently had a huge milestone. You went past the 1 million views. So do you want to go right back to the start and, and tell us why you started it and how it's developed? Developed over time. Yeah, you know what's funny about that, Matt, is I don't know if I would have a YouTube channel if my older son didn't start a YouTube channel. He did, I think, wow. back in, I think, early 2018, just as a whim, just to kind of make some goofy videos and put that up there. So again, early 18, I believe. And I saw him do that. And I thought, hmm, that's kind of cool. And then I also thought, you know, I've got 150 or so cameras here collecting dust on my shelf. So I thought, <laughs> Maybe I could do something with my cameras and put it onto uh, YouTube as well. So I initially started that in, I think my first video was July, July 22nd, actually, of 2018. It was a review of the Minolta AFC, one of my favorite compact point and shoots uh, that doesn't get a lot of love, but it's a, it's a pretty capable pretty capable camera. It's about the size of a Lomo LCA, roughly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did that because, again, I had a bunch of negatives that I had scanned onto my hard drive and I really wasn't doing anything with them. I think at one point I probably was uploading them to Flickr, yeah. uh, which I haven't uploaded to Flickr in a while. Like a lot of people, it's, it's a great platform. Don't get me wrong. It's just, I can't tell you the last time I, I did anything on there. So instead of just letting these files and, and pictures languish on my hard drive, uh, I thought, you know, I can just maybe, maybe as part of the review, I can show some of the pictures in my YouTube video. So I put together these montages and once I did that, that's really what I kind of fell in love with. And I, a lot of people, I think, like to watch the montages, too. Mm. Uh, back then, when I started, it was just the still images. And I really, when I started, I just I took advantage of pictures I'd already taken. I think one of the ways the channel has, has evolved is now um, I probably, after almost 300 or so videos, I think I've burned through all the images on my hard drive. Now I'm actually actively, yeah, I'm going out and taking, you know, pictures now. Uh, to provide for the channel, which is a great opportunity to get out. And I look at, I, I put out about a video a week on my channel and have done that again for about five, I guess, five and a half years now. And it it's really kind of like having a, a photography project every single week. Yeah. So uh, people talk about, you know, it's I, they want to hold themselves accountable. It's like, I want to shoot film this year. I want to shoot more film and just, you know, keep up with it having that weekly, you know, self-imposed weekly deadline, I guess is what it is really, but it keeps me on track. And now when I go out and do, uh, I'll do photo montages of the images I get with uh, some of the cameras I've acquired through the years. Uh, I like to include some, some scenes, some video of the scenes that I'm in as well. So I'll yep. kind of take some video and then, you know, pan back and forth, sometimes zoom in, zoom out. And then I'll show, I'll transition then to the still images. So that's a big change from when I when I started. And to me, that's the fun part. I love I love going out and taking the taking the shots. I love editing the video together. Uh, recording myself on camera is probably not my favorite thing. And maybe you can relate to that with your YouTube channel. <laughs> yep. uh, just kind of the awkwardness of, you know, you staring yeah. into a camera, uh, trying to envision somebody watching you, you know, and trying trying to put a personal face on it. But it it is kind of weird talking to yourself in a sense. Uh, but I don't mind doing that. I think the more I've done, I've gotten probably a little bit more comfortable with it as well. Yeah. But uh, for me, I just love getting out and shooting. And uh, again, actually using the gear that I've acquired. I, again, I've got a ridiculous amount of cameras. 
certainly haven't used them all, but uh, again, after roughly 300 videos, I'm I'm getting through them. Yep, that's good to hear. And it's interesting, like I have watched your videos. I think you were at a sort of, I think you were, it's like a, maybe a museum or historical place recently where you're inside a little shop or something and you were panning across and then you took a photo. How do you find that? Like when I'm, usually I'm a, I'm a one man operation, so I do everything myself. How do you yep, find that? You, you, you know, I mean, I, sometimes I'm out taking photos and think, oh yeah, I'm going to shoot this and do a YouTube video. And then halfway through the roll, I think, oh man, I just took a really cool photo back there and I forgot to get the B-roll footage of, right. of the scene. Do you, you know, how disciplined are you with that? Are you, are you it's always at the front of your mind or? I would say at this point, yes. In the past, again, not so much. Probably the yep. first maybe couple of years of my channel, I didn't really take much in the way of video or B-roll. I just, again, took these still images yeah. showcase those but now uh if i think there's even an inkling that i'm going to use my images for a youtube video uh i'll i'll take i'll take video of the the scenes that i'm into uh, wherever yeah. i'm at and i would tell you how i do it um i don't have any fancy gear i i use my phone for almost all those kind of shots and as you know these days if you have a you know halfway decent smartphone you've got a pretty good camera right in your pocket so i don't need to take That's a right. bunch of extra gear. and i don't typically I don't do much in the way of uh, vlogging, like out in the field. So I don't really have to worry about the audio, yeah. uh, whether it's, you know, excess wind, that sort of thing. That's not really a concern of mine yeah. because more often than not, I'm going to be putting some kind of music on there anyway to kind of enhance the mood of the video. So the audio is really not that important to me uh, out in the field. I have done a few things out in the field, that kind of thing, but uh, few and far between. You have done a couple of fancy drone shots, though, from memory, haven't you? I have, and that's been a while. I uh, can't fire up the drone again when it's 20 degrees out yeah, and uh, it's too cold. dark most of the day. Uh, yeah. The drone's been put away for a while, but uh, you've reminded me of that here in the spring. I hope to get that out again, but yeah. Excellent. Drone is fun. I don't know if you have a lot of experience with drone photography or videography, but um, there are a lot of restrictions as yeah. far as where you can fly them. Uh, and if you can't fly, if you're in a restricted zone, at least the way mine is set up, it will ground you. It won't let you fly, which wow. is kind of nice. Occasionally, yeah. I've got like a, you know, not really a, like a red warning, but maybe yellow one saying, hey, you're kind of pushing it. You're kind of getting on the borderline. So you better watch where you're going around. You know, obviously things you don't want to be taking video around a, a school with kids around. Mm. Uh, would never do that. Um, but things you might not think of, too, like government buildings, uh, prisons, that sort of thing. Not that I yeah. hang out in prisons a lot, but um, those kind of things, there's a lot of restricted zones. So you are at least somewhat limited by where you're allowed to fly. Now I've got like a very light drone. It, it's a DGI of some sort. It's a mini yep. hair, me too, something like that, but it's very light. So, uh, I believe it's, ju it's just under the weight limit where I don't need to have a license for it. At least currently, that's my understanding. Um, the laws are changing though. So I think they're getting, if anything, more restrictive. So we'll see once we thaw out here in central Ohio in the U S uh, I hope to get it out again. Excellent. I, a couple of years ago, probably like five years ago now, I did a full drone course and, mm -hmm. um, you know, we had to go to this little airport in Brisbane, not Brisbane airport, but another one uh, mm -hmm. out at Archerfield. And you did a whole week's course and you learned about the radio and all that kind of stuff, uh, which is oh, really wow. cool. I mean, I've probably, I've got all the manuals up there, probably forgotten half of it now. Um, but one of the, my favorite drone shots was there was a, as an ocean pool. I'm not sure if you've seen these in Australia, but they're, they're swimming pools on the beach and they fill up with seawater so you're literally oh. swimming in a swimming pool but it's on the sea and it's got salt water in because it comes in from the sea so they're very very right. iconic in australia especially in like around sydney area uh, and i did a i wanted to take an overhead drone shot of that but i actually looked on the maps and it's where some of sometimes some of our um fighter like uh aircraft fly so you have to look up all of the schedules you have yep. to make sure that they're not flying there that that time so it can be i got a really great shot but it's, it's it can be a little bit yeah that's the main worry i always have is am i in near an airport or not um mm -hmm. so there you go but a lot of fun anyway we, we, we'll, we'll move on from the drones because as much as fun as they are we're here to talk about your your sort of main passion uh, which is film now you've got over almost 300 videos now now there's a yep. couple of digicam videos in there but i yes. reckon probably 90 odd percent is is all film is that correct that is correct. Yeah, I, I have picked up a few digicams here and there. I got uh, one of the Kodak Easy Share something, starts yep. with a C. I don't know what it is. I know that I got it for eight bucks and it is a CCD sensor. And I took it actually to a recent trip to New York. I took back with my wife in um, September of this yep. uh, this past year. And uh, it's very bare bones. It's four megapixels and uh, it's, it's all JPEG. Of course, there's no raw files or anything like that. 
you have very little control over anything like focus or anything like that. It's it really is a bare bones, very basic JPEG point and shoot. And I had a blast shooting it. You know, with one of those things, it's it's a little bit like uh, the experience with a Holga uh, mm. film camera. Yeah. All you do is you concentrate on composition because yeah. you can't really control anything else. So it kind of frees you up just to kind of, you know, see the scene uh, that you want and capture it uh, at the click of a button. The one thing, again, and maybe you can relate to this too, using digicams and that sort of thing, uh, the shutter delay is something that I still kind of forgot about. And every time I pick up a digicam, it's like, oh, yeah, you have to actually wait for it to take the picture on a lot of these old models, of course. The newer mm. ones are obviously better. But uh, ones from, you know, 2005, 2006, that sort of thing. There is that little bit of lag that still takes a little a little getting used, but it's all good. So I, I yeah. do enjoy using uh, Digicams uh, occasionally. It's not my focus, but uh, I certainly have no problem using them. And they're fun for a break. And I will tell you, there's something liberating about not having to develop your film, scan it, worry about, you know, getting all the dust particles out of there yep. in the post-processing. So... It's kind of nice just to uh, let her rip and, you know, save it to an SD card and you're done. Yeah, absolutely. Do you also like shoot with digital cameras, you know, for family stuff or, you know, what's your sort of focus for that? I do. I do. And I have, again, um, what would be probably looked down upon today by any, you know, self-respecting gearhead. I have an old Canon SL1 DSLR. I think they're up to at least SL3 by now. Uh, but anyway, I've had it for years and years and years. But I bust that out if uh, I'm doing family photos sometimes. A uh, recent example here, a couple months ago, I think it's back in November, I shot pictures, uh, basically senior or graduation pictures for oh, all awesome. my son's friends in high school. Yep. And that's a case where, you know, the, the shooting film camera, at least in this setting for me, didn't make sense. You know, you know nothing wrong with taking graduation or, or senior photos on film, but much quicker turnaround with digital. And uh, it worked out great. Now, one thing I like is, uh, that being a Canon uh, EOS SLR, I can use those same lenses on most of my Canon EOS cameras. Yeah. Uh, so it's a it's a seamless transition. So sometimes I will take both digital and and film, and then just swap the lenses out from body to body. So uh, yeah, so I do still, but honestly, I probably do the most digital photography now on my phone, like I do the video. So the yeah. phones again, they're getting more and more capable. So. You can get some good shots with these phones these days. Absolutely, yeah. Now you're speaking about your family there, and and they feature from prominently in your videos. Has that always been the case, or like I know with my own family, sometimes when the kids were little, they didn't mind being in the videos. But as my daughter gets older, she wanted pre-approval about having her pictures. And I'm like, but I've got a really beautiful picture of it on this film, uh, and I've actually stopped asking her now because she doesn't watch the videos, and you know she looks beautiful in them. But have your family always right. been so enthusiastic, or has there been any time where they pushed back a little, or? It's kind of funny. It depends on the family member you're talking about. My older son, the one who started the YouTube channel a while back, and he kind of abandoned it, honestly. But, um, you know, he was obviously comfortable being on camera because he started his own channel. And uh, he's more of a ham, I guess, the ham of the family, probably more than any of us. And he loves being on camera. And matter of fact, he's home from college right now or university. And uh, he actually asked me last week, he said, hey, dad, do you think we can go out and maybe take some... Uh, some photos. So I took the opportunity then we grabbed some digital, of course, like I was just saying, uh, saying a few minutes ago, but uh, I shot a whole roll of the new Harmon Phoenix 200 film. Yes. Nothing but portraits of my son. With the and, cowboy uh, so hat. Cowboy hat. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, saw yeah, that. I saw them. They're really the good. Cowboy yeah. hat. And, yeah. and some of those turned out pretty good. I, Very uh, nice. I overexposed it or, or exposed it for uh, 100 uh, ISO or EI. And I think that helped. Now, did I blow out a bunch of highlights? Absolutely. But the results I've seen at 200, some of them, at least the initial results when people were testing it, looked a little bit dark, a little bit money to me. So I thought, you know what? Uh, and it was overcast already that day. I said, I'm going to go ahead and over uh, overexpose it or shoot it at 100. And overall, again, outside of some blown highlights, I can live with that. Uh, I was pretty happy with the results. So he's been very open to it. Uh, he's at school now. His major is communication studies. So again, he's comfortable with communication, media, being on camera. Uh other family members, not so much, you know, I uh, sometimes will, you know, ask my wife nicely if she, if I could take some pictures of her and uh, she obliges me <laughs> sometimes yeah. more frequently than others. My younger son, he's 16, so he's kind of too cool for that right now, but yeah. he'll occasionally uh, sit for some portraits too. So they are relatively willing subjects. My older son, uh, again, he loves it and sometimes will come up to me and ask request for me to take pictures. So That's he's awesome. good with it. 
Yeah. Your wife, though, is very supportive because I saw she bought you a beautiful neon sign. She did indeed. So we're just figuring she actually went out tonight to buy some command hooks to figure out where we're going to hang it up and exactly yeah. how we're going to put it in the studio. And she bought a couple of different kind of hooks. So we'll see. I was telling her and, and you can relate to this, but, you know, filming your videos that sometimes we have the focus set up so that it's focused on us and the background yeah. is kind of blurred out. I'm like, well, you know, if I want that sign to be in focus, I might have to kind of reconfigure that or maybe sit closer to it or just not have that that separation or use a different aperture or something to get maybe more in focus. Yeah. Um, but I'm sure sometime in the new year here, that will be making appearance on my channel too. But uh, yeah, I put that up on my Instagram and uh, put it on my YouTube community page. And a lot of people thought it was very cool. And yeah, like sure. they thought it was a fantastic gift and something yeah. is uh, very thoughtful, which is pretty typical of my wife. So with your family or your sons, have you had any kind of, you know, localized kind of fame? And now I'll explain this. My daughter, um, obviously people, she goes to high school and kids have found out at high school that, you know, she might have showed them a photo that I took and they'll they'll see that it's on a YouTube or it might be an article on F-Stoppers. And then they found the YouTube channel. And then all mm -hmm. of a sudden I'm getting, you know, phone calls from my daughter after school saying, oh, so, you know, so-and-so wants to say hello to you. Hi, Matt Loves Cameras. And, you know, and they'll say, oh, say hi to your dad for me. And, and just, you know, funny little things like that. <laughs> and I'm not suggesting I'm in any way, shape or form famous, but, you know, is there sort of any sort of recognition amongst your your family's friends or whatever that, you know, that you're a bit of a, you know, YouTube film sensation? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think of the Ron Burgundy line. I'm kind of a big deal. Uh, but yeah, it has come up actually with some of my uh, family's friends and that sort of thing. And they were surprised or sometimes uh, my wife said to a coworker, she's like, oh, yeah, my, that's my husband does this channel. And uh, kind of a friend of a friend was like, oh, wait, he's the old camera guy. I know him. And they, they were already following me, which is kind of cool. Oh, yeah. Uh, another place that's coming up. And I, I don't know if you've done a lot of this yet or not, but going to different um, beers and cameras events. And I know they have cameras and coffees and the different things. I don't know how active those kind of meetings are in uh, Australia for you. But we've been having a lot of them here. I went to one in Chicago. I went to one in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. And um, people came up to me there and said, oh, I love your channel. It's just, it, you, you're kind of taking it back because you don't, you, again, like you said, it's a solitary uh, experience. Yeah. You know, you're in the camera, but then you realize, oh, people are actually watching this. They do a lot of times appreciate what you're doing. So uh, that has come up. Probably the weirdest one is uh, my day job is I'm an optometrist. So I'm an eye doctor. Oh, wow. And uh, that's what I do and have done for, well, 29 years now, quite a while. Yeah. But I had a patient one time. I saw his name. He saw my name. It's like, <laughs> wait a minute. I know you. You know me. And he was, a, again, a follower and a subscriber. And I followed him on Instagram. So, oh, wow. Uh, yeah. So that was kind of nice. I had him as a patient. And then here yeah. we are. We kind of knew each other outside of that setting, yeah. too. So it uh, it has come up. And it's, it's you know, it's uh, it's always kind of cool when it does, you know. Yeah. Uh, sure. It doesn't happen every day, but, you know, I, I would expect it more at photo meetups. And we've had some cl local Columbus ones, too, where uh, people have, have recognized me and asked to take the picture with me. And I said, oh, great. Can I take a picture of you? And it's it's been a great experience. So, again, not every day, but it has happened. I think it's happened to me mostly at um, camera fairs. So yep. like I might have a stand at a camera fair selling film and zines and, and cameras and whatever. And someone will come up and go, hi, Matt, how are you? Um, I, blah, blah, blah. And they'll, they'll tell me something and I won't instantly recognize them from say their Instagram, you know, right. picture or whatever. And I'll, I'll, sometimes I have to say to them, I'm sorry, who who are you? And they'll say, oh, I'm so-and-so. And I'm like, oh, of course, I'm so sorry. I didn't recognize you. So that's the only um, sort of anxiety producing thing about it for me is that like you're worried that sometimes you can't remember, you can't instantly recognize them if they've got a hat on or glasses or yeah, right. it's a bit, it's a bit uh, like that. But yeah, we, we haven't, I think Brisbane, Brisbane is physically a really big place. So we, mm. there's a lot of talk about people doing meetups, but this, it doesn't seem to be at the moment many in the film photography space where people meet up um, mm -hmm. which is a shame because we should definitely get something going um, like that now over your 293 videos uh, has there been a video that you've done that you're really proud of you put a lot of work in and it just absolutely bombed and no one watched it and you were really disappointed yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah a lot of them I would say most of them no <laughs> <laughs> no surely there not. have been a few uh, and I think it's I could I would identify maybe categories of videos um, Every time I do a film swap video where, you know, and I think you've participated in these before, you're certainly familiar with them where, you know, one photographer shoots a whole roll of film, they rewind it, they send it off to another photographer and the second photographer shoots over it to make some kind of interesting, hopefully interesting double exposures, multiple exposures, but you never really know what you're going to get because you don't know what the first photography has taken. Yeah. You have no really control over that. 
I am fascinated by those. I love watching them. I love making the videos and nobody watches them. <laughs> at least yep. the ones I've made so far. I mean, I, yeah. I, I should say nobody, but it's it's hard to crack, you know, six or 700 views on one of those. Yeah. Uh, so they don't they don't get the eyeballs that other ones do. And that's, I kind of wish they did because I, I just think it's it's a cool thing. Now, the people that watch them have really appreciated it and, and, uh, and told me so in the comments and that sort of thing. Uh, probably the other category that, uh, and I've, I've only done a couple of these so far, but Super 8. I've done a couple oh, of Super yeah. 8 videos, mm. which I think are like the coolest thing. And if you've shot Super 8, you know you know that feeling or really any kind of motion picture, whether it's a uh, regular 8mm Super 8, 16, whatever. Uh, even the Lomo Kino, if you remember that, you took mm. uh, kind of yeah. the, the motion picture on a on a 35mm cassette. But I'm fascinated by those. I love putting them together, editing, uh, and then putting the music with it, that sort of thing. And those so far have kind of debuted to crickets as well, but uh, probably just as well, because that's hopefully would discourage me from spending, you know, a hundred dollars or so yeah. on one roll. It's expensive. Yeah. I think if it were half the cost, uh, you can bet I'd be shooting it a lot more. So it's safe to say that you're not going to buy the new Kodak Super 8 camera. <laughs> For a cool $5,500. Mm, I yeah. think I'm going to sit this one out. On yeah. One. How, about, yeah. how about you? <laughs> Well, definitely not for that one. Um, I do have a beautiful Canon Super 8 camera. I can't remember which model it is. It's just sitting up here out of um, out of my arm's reach. I've shot mm -hmm. one uh, cartridge on that. It turned out really well. I think yep. I did a podcast years ago about it. And it's, it's funny mm -hmm. with having a podcast for a few years, like three years and a regular podcast now sort of only semi-regular. I mean, this will go out on the podcast as well as YouTube. But uh, I've actually going back to my, I was on my website the other day and I found a whole load of like content. I'm like, I've done one about Super 8. I've done one about the Canon Prima. I've done one about the, the robot camera. And yep. I'm actually now going to turn all those into YouTube videos because I've already done the research and I've got the videos and the photos for it. Um, right. So I've got, I've taken one cartridge on Super 8 already, which turned out pretty well. Mm -hmm. got another one in there but the only thing that discourages me about it is just the cost of awesome. of getting it yeah it's it's like yeah. uh you know what for me too yeah it's so i think i will shoot get this other one done i think we're going away on a day trip next week to the beach so i might shoot some of that there but yeah it's just the it's just the cost of getting it done yep i've got two cameras that are super eight well actually i do have one i can reach i think uh this yep. is um 20 bucks ebay yep. and just the sound how cool is this? I just, I love it. Uh, so again, um, love shooting it. But again, if the cost, it's, this is a, uh, it's a GAF XL 120. Yeah. So uh, again, nothing fancy. It is fixed focus. So you don't have to mess with anything like that. Uh, this one does not have a zoom or anything like that. So it's very bare bones, but again, 20 bucks on eBay. Couldn't pass it up. I have another one. That's a, uh, I believe it's a Bell and Howell. And it's one that Mike Rosso from the FPP oh, recommended. Yeah. And I also got a pretty, I got a $20 deal on that one too. I've not shot with that one yet. That one does have a zoom on it. I think it's just like a two times zoom. And again, very basic fixed focus. Um, but that's kind of what I like about it because I don't want to be, you know, messing with a bunch of settings and that sort of thing and trying mm -hmm. to manually focus thing. Uh, the, the older I get, the less my eyes you can focus. focus. <laughs> you may relate, relate uh, to that too. So Definitely. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So that's why I'm sitting close to the camera right here because I don't have my glasses on. I didn't get a lot of glare off of the screen. Yeah, so I, uh, I'm Fortunately, sitting quite close. I'm, um, anything within about a, about a foot and a half, I, I just, yep. everything's just like a blur and I can't say, so unfortunately I have to wear these. Um, I, yep. Yeah. I think about contacts at one stage, but I'm not sure about, anyway. Um, yep. So yeah, the, the one video, I watched one of your Super 8 videos, it might've been the New York one or might've been a different one. But it, mm -hmm. The footage looked really good. Like it, yeah. it looked like the one I've got, the Canon one, I think you've got a focus, which doesn't really <laughs> suit me that much because I'm not a big manual focuser. But I was like, right. wow, yours looked like the camera itself looked a bit basic, but the footage looked fantastic. Yeah. I, I thought it turned out real good too. And I got it done uh, again through Mike Rosso um, at the Film Photography Project slash podcast. And uh, I don't, I didn't buy the film there. I, they have a package deal where you can buy the film there and then send it in for processing. And it's, you know, they make it pretty streamlined. Uh, I got my film elsewhere, but just because I didn't want to swallow all $95 at once. So I think I split up and bought the cartridge for like 40 bucks somewhere else, saved a little money and then yeah. spent the other 60 or so. And he gives you the option of uh, different resolutions. And I got like most things, I didn't get the cheapest. I didn't certainly didn't get the most expensive, but I could pick one that was in the middle. And uh, I agree. I think, you know, for a $20 camera, mm. I was, I was happy. It turned out pretty sure. well. Yeah. What do you think about being uh, like, there's a lot of film photography channels and a lot of them are very, uh, you know, very cool, very hip people, maybe in their twenties. 
uh, very stylized, um, you know, what's, what's your sort of take on being, you know, we're both Gen X. I mean, what, what's your yep. take on being an older Gen X film photography YouTuber? Um, what, what are the sort of the, the pros and cons? Yeah. So the pro is we're not like everybody else out there, I think, honestly, and, and not the saying, you know, that's not to say that other people in their 40s slash 50s are not out there with film photography channels. There certainly are. But like you said, the ones that most people know of are not Gen X. They're certainly mm -hmm. younger than both of us. And uh, so in one way that sets it apart, so it sets us apart. And I think that's honestly why I chose the name for my channel. I did the old camera guy. It's kind of a yep. take on, well, I'm an old camera. I'm an old guy. I use old cameras. So yeah. it kind of fit both, you know, describes both. But I kind of leaned into it rather than, you know, I'm not I'm not trying to present myself as a 20 something, you know, kid uh, shooting film for the first time. So yeah, uh, been around a while. But again, you know, I lean into it. So it sets us apart. And I think on YouTube, at least my experience has been or my my philosophy is you don't have to be maybe the best photographer out there. You just have to be different. Set, your, mm. set yourself apart in some way. So just the fact that, you know, I am, am now in my 50s, it does set me apart. Uh, you know, as far as cons, I don't know what the cons are uh, other than I think YouTube may probably favor the young. I think that's probably fair to say because, you know, being in your 50s uh, in the real world is, you know, by some people considered old, maybe middle aged. Um, but in YouTube years, it's more like being extinct, <laughs> like a dinosaur, sure, sure. Um, but I don't let it slow me down, you know? Yeah. So it's one of those things. So I can't really think a lot of cons to it. Plus, even if I could think a lot of cons, can't do anything about it. You know, right. I can't reverse my age. You can't either. Nobody can. So uh, yeah, I've just embrace it. Yeah. Now uh, I know you're on TikTok as well. And yep. you have done some shorts on YouTube. I've I've recently up uploaded. I've kind of, I kind of this recycling content thing again, where I yep. used to, I used to make stuff, uh, you know, 12, 18 months ago for TikTok. It did really well. The algorithm yep. changed, and all of a sudden, instead of getting a thousand views, I'm getting like 150. And I kind of yeah. I wouldn't say I gave up, but I, well, I kind of gave up. But I've recently found all these videos on my phone, which unbrand. Then I haven't got the TikTok branding across them because I shared them to Instagram Reels. But I've, yep. I've uploaded a few of them to shorts, and they've done really well. And so I'm yeah. kind of thinking now, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to upload more shorts. H how does, you know, the, sh the shorter videos, obviously you've got 293 videos. Most of them are the longer form ones. How do yep. short videos, either TikTok or Instagram reels or shorts, how does that all fit into what you, you do? Yeah, it's kind of funny you said it like that, where you said I didn't really give up on it on TikTok, but I kind of did. <laughs> Honestly, I have, I've adopted the same philosophy because when uh, YouTube shorts came around, and when Instagram Reels really started to get much more popular, I I don't see as much need for a platform like TikTok. Um, and if we, if we think we're old on on YouTube on TikTok, yeah. I mean that's it's we're like three times as, as old as anybody else, which is okay. It's a it's a young person's medium by and large. Uh, there are older people on there, but not a lot. Uh, so I have I I just uploaded for the first time in TikTok. I think maybe yesterday, day before, something like that. Uh, and that was first time in. I can't remember when. <laughs> so yeah. you know, I, I technically have an account on there. I don't actively do anything with it. So now uh, my short form content is more likely to end up on YouTube shorts and commonly on uh, Instagram reels as well. And you probably come across this too uh, with your social media presence. You, you got to be careful if you add music to any of these that yeah. uh, you can't use it on every platform. You know, if yeah. you have a license, like I have a license with um, Epidemic Sound. I use them oh, for yeah. my YouTube content. It's a great service. I'm not sponsored by them. I just think they do a great service. They get a fantastic selection. I've had a very good experience with them. Uh, so I use their uh, audio for YouTube shorts, but I haven't used it on any other platform. Uh, Instagram Reels, uh, you talked about the algorithm algorithm on, uh, on TikTok changing. Uh, the algorithm on Instagram has obviously morphed and changed throughout the years as well. I think, you know, primarily when it started, it was I viewed it as a as still, still a photograph medium. Mm -hmm. And now I think their uh, Instagram was a lot more video heavy. At least that's been my observation. Maybe you've come across that too. Um, but some people have have kind of eschewed Instagram for that. We're like, well, you know, they're, they're not doing still pictures anymore. Uh, they're all they're favoring is, is real. And my response to that is, okay, well then make videos. Um, mm -hmm. But I think, you know, you and I being on YouTube and, and TikTok, we're more maybe comfortable with making or producing videos. Uh, the vertical video, you know, I, most of my images I take are uh, 
in uh, landscape format. Same, same. Yeah, so I Challenge. don't do a lot of portrait. Yeah, yeah, I don't do a lot of portrait orientation. So taking those images in portrait, I'm I'm still doing that. Yeah. Uh, somebody like our mutual friend Lucy Lumen. I mean, yeah. she takes fantastic portrait. Uh, yes uh, photography it takes she, most of her that way yeah, yeah, yeah and it's it's it, her content is tailor-made for reels shorts uh tiktok although she doesn't really do much in the way of tiktok i guess but um it's perfect for that i just wish i could embrace the portrait orientation a little bit more and i have like said yeah. the portraits that I took my son on that uh harman phoenix 200 recently i took the entire role uh portrait orientation because i knew it was going to end up in a youtube yeah. short and probably a reel as well so awesome. sometimes I go into a project with that very specific uh, mindset of that, you know, I'm going to force myself to take portrait orientation, but uh, it's not, it's not how I see the world. I, I, I yeah. see the world in landscape orientation, which a lot of people do, I think. So, uh, but I, you know, I've, I've been doing a little bit more of it. Uh, the more I do of it, the more I appreciate it and embrace it. But I still, again, my, just my default mode is portrait uh, or is landscape orientation instead. And, I don't see that changing, which is why, to your point, I've done a lot more long form comment uh, content in the landscape orientation than portrait. But um, I'm trying to change that slowly. And again, yeah. you know, you, you said I've seen a lot of your uh, as you said, you were very active on TikTok. Every time I turned around, you had a new TikTok video and uh, <laughs> yeah. a lot of views and a lot of it. You know, people really engaged with them and it was very good content. But uh, like you said, TikTok, I found the same thing that just the engagement. And the algorithm is very different than it was a year, year and a half ago. Yeah, it was. About, I think it was about Halloween, not last year, Halloween 2022, around that time, they just, they did something and there was a lot of TikTok videos about it. And all of yep. a sudden the, the views just went, shoo, and yep. yeah, you kind of felt like, well, you know, is it, is it worth doing these anymore? Because you, you put a lot of, you know, um, a lot of, you know, blood, sweat and tears into making a video. It might take an hour, even for a, sh two, even for a 60 second video, it might take you an hour, mm -hmm. an hour, two hours, sure. who, who knows to create it. Yep. Uh, and I guess back then I probably didn't have the foresight. I knew about YouTube shorts. Um, but as I've, I've told other people, I'm, even though I've got a YouTube channel now, I've never been a YouTube person. I'll go to YouTube if I need to fix something or work out how something works, mm -hmm. but I'm not yep. someone who watches YouTube like people watch TV. And so I didn't even mm -hmm. really know much. I didn't know any of the film photographers on YouTube. I didn't really, yeah. what's shorts? What the hell is shorts? I don't even know what this <laughs> is. And so I'm, yeah. I'm kind of late to all this. And I've only just realized like in the last, I think the thing was I uploaded one short probably about a year ago about a Canon camera and it kept yeah. creeping up in my top five all the time. I'm like, what? That, I posted that ages ago. Why does that keep cre creeping up? Mm -hmm. But it's had over 10,000, oh, I've had almost 10,000 views now. And that mm -hmm. was, it, it took me a year to work out, hang on, this is, this is actually done really well. I should upload more of these. I'm a, I'm a bit slow, yep. Dave. So that is now my philosophy. And another part of what I'm doing now is actually very much tied into um, something very inspirational from you. When you posted on Facebook about your million views, I think it was another YouTuber. I can't remember who it was, but she said something like, oh, um, this is inspirational. How do you do it? And you said, I've done one a week for five years. And, you know, consistency seems to be obviously as well as, you know, being very charming and having great content, but, you know, consistency definitely seems to be a key uh, driver of your success. Right. I think just half of it is just showing up, you know, that, that gets you a long way. And just to continue, as you say, consistency, keep showing up. It's not a one and done. And, yeah. uh, you know, my view of it is I it's it's uh, you've heard this before a million times. It's it's a marathon, not a sprint. So uh, you don't want to get burned out. You know, I'm, I'm sure that we would get, you know, both of us would get more views if that's really, you know, what we're after. If we uploaded, you know, two, three times a week, maybe uh, it's a great way to burn out, too. So yeah. uh, the once a week cadence for me uh, has been a challenge to uh, sustain sometimes. Certainly, you know, life. Life happens. Life yeah. gets in the way sometimes. So, you know, you have to have your priorities. And sometimes this kind of stuff uh, deservedly will take a back seat. But uh, for the most part, again, you know, just stick with it and don't give up because uh, and, and have a passion for it and don't view it as a chore. It does mm. seem I mean, it certainly takes as much time as a part time, maybe even full time job sometimes. Uh, don't get a lot of sleep sometimes just, you know, after work, working on editing and that kind of thing. And then on yeah. your days off, going out and shooting that sort of thing. But uh, it's a labor of love. I'm, I'm, I would assume you feel the same way about it and, and still enjoying doing it. And that's why you're still doing it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've always got a buzz out of creating content. And, and 10 years ago, it was writing blogs. Uh, yep. and, and back to 
back to Instagram, I remember when Instagram was a mobile phone app and it's still obviously an app, but it was for mobile camera, you know, camera photography. It wasn't yep. for, I've taken an image on my Nikon or Canon and I'm going to post it through my photo to Instagram. It was a right. phone photography app, just phone photos. And I remember yep. the change of that and everyone getting angry about that. So no, these, yeah. these apps seem to change and move all the time. Um, sure. I can't remember what the, my point was. Your, your, I can't remember what my train of thought now. What were we talking about? Well, it's really just the consistency and the mediums oh, yeah. and doing it for the love of it, I think. is Yeah, really, for sure. You know, if you're not enjoying doing it, why would you keep on doing it? So, That's right. Uh, you know, the, the love of it, I think, is what helps me with the consistency. You know, if I get to a point where I do get burned out, don't enjoy it and don't yeah. see a point doing it. Uh, you know, this, it's it's too much work to do if you don't enjoy it. So you, sure. you better enjoy it. You know, yeah. or you know why bother excellent so now we're going to do a little bit of a show and tell kind of um uh section now we're going to do some best frugal choices with dave mahali yeah. the old camera guy and the first sure. one is the first category i've chosen i've got a few cameras here as well this one is the best bang for your buck brand new camera you can buy today so we're not talking about a camera mm. you might find on marketplace or in a thrift store you yeah. go into a retail store what is the best brand new bang for buck camera you can buy today i'll tell you one i really like matt is uh and i'm going to cheat maybe a little bit on this one because the one i have is not brand new but you can get them new and that is i've got one here actually i have the original but the vivitar yes. wide and slim uh, ultra wide and slim uws there it is and you've yep. got again the new one retail version yeah uh, but again it, it's i mean the new one is the exact copy outside of the color uh i mean even the, the styling on the side here just where you know where you grip it it's really the same. Uh, this is one, again, you've got one. I, I'm assuming you enjoy it like I do. Uh, yep. It's great lo-fi. You get a lot of, you know, vignetting. You vignetting. get a lot of glare. You shoot it right in the sun. You're getting all kinds of crazy glare. Yeah. Uh, and the pictures look like you shot them on film. They really do. Yeah. Nobody would mistake this for a fancy digital camera. And you can get these, you know, uh, it'd be different in Australian dollars, but I know it's, it's under 30 bucks US yeah. uh, typically. So, you know, for under 30 bucks to get a camera that's, fun and you're not going to take pictures inside with this typically uh unless you push maybe or uh, use 1600 or 3200 speed film something like that but uh it's a great it's a great outdoor camera and again funky lo-fi images so this would probably be my top one for uh new ones you can get fantastic yeah that is that's my choice as well this is the rideau version i do have the vivitar ultra one slim original in fact i've got two of them somewhere up on shelves around here but yeah mm -hmm. that would definitely be my version uh, my choice as well for the best best brand new yep. camera you can buy it does it takes really fantastic images beautiful ultra wide uh you know viewpoints so yeah we agree on that one that's fantastic i thought you might choose the one of the ektar cameras because you know that one of those ektar cameras has delivered you a, a bucket load of views on youtube it, it has and that's one that uh you know you asked me before about videos that just haven't performed or gotten a lot of views and uh, that i was kind of disappointed in one that took me by surprise is the my very first uh Ektar H35 video, and it's sitting right now. I think last time I checked was 199,000 views. <laughs> so it's going to hit 200k here sometime, probably shortly, uh, which still kind of blows my mind. But I think that was a, a case of you know putting out a decent video, but also putting it out at the right time because hmm. uh, I was at the forefront of that movement because I got a pre-production model, so I was able to release it as soon as they released the camera. Yeah, I would. I had my video out in the first day, and as you know, uh, the time timing is everything in uh, yeah in YouTube. For sure, I was watching. Um, I only caught part of it because I was working, but um, Bellamy had a Japan Camera Hunter um, live. I think it was yesterday or the day before, and I think someone asked him, "Oh, are you going to do a Phoenix a video on your your Phoenix, your role of Harmon Phoenix?" And I think his answer was something along the lines of well, everyone, every man and his dog's already done a video about it. There's no point me doing one now. And this is the yeah. thing about a lot of these new films, new cameras. If you're not in there near the start, uh, I mean, it's, I'm not saying it's not worth doing, but it's it's certainly there's an advantage, isn't there, in, in getting a video out pretty quick? Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I was did you didn't did you get uh, any Harmon phoenix 200 ahead of ahead of schedule or uh pre-release no, i i haven't shot any of it they obviously don't love me so i i didn't get any no <laughs> i didn't either but uh i got it i think december 4th i think is when i got it because my local shop said they're going to start uh, uh, carrying it then or selling yep. it then um so i went out got two rolls shot the first one made a video on it uh which is pretty well received and again i was starting to say before i i one thing that's nice about not having enough juice to get it pre-released like you and I apparently didn't 
is that uh, we got to see the other examples. We got to see what other people's pictures look like. So we yeah. could kind of take their results and maybe learn from them and adjust. And which is why I think if I would have got a pre-release, I would have shot it at 200 and uh, probably wouldn't have been as happy with my images. But the fact that I saw these other images from all mm -hmm. these other creators, uh, photographers, let me know that, hey, maybe I ought to try overexposing this, maybe shoot it at 100 or 125. And I'm and so it ended up being a blessing in disguise. So yeah, I didn't, I wasn't the first on the block to get it. Uh, and I'm okay with that. But, uh, you know, having seen the other results, it actually benefited me because I'm I'm happier with the, the pictures of my results that I got. For sure. I think there was a bit of a distribution problem because there was a couple of us uh, Australians who commented on Harmon's post and said, yeah, great. you got a new film. How, you know, it's in America, it's in Europe, it's in the UK. Mm. And there was, it wasn't any in Australia for a few days, then only one store stocked it. And then gradually over two weeks, it comes into stores. But that yeah. kind of put me off because I thought, well, if, you know, two, three weeks, four weeks into it, um, you know, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just pick up some at another time. Um, yeah. but that was kind of my, my rationale there, I think. So the next topic we have is the best value film that you can buy today in store. What have you chosen, Dave? What have I chosen? So best value film. Um, well, my first thought is black and white, which tends not always, but tends to be cheaper than color. And my choice would be probably, uh, I think I have one somewhere here. Here I have one. Um, Arista EDU. Yes. Uh, I've got the 400 speed. Of course, it comes in 100, 200. And this, as most people probably know at this point, is uh, rebadged or rebranded FOMA film. This one does not have DX coding. Mm -hmm. So if you have a camera that requires that or you want to have the DX coding, uh, you can just get FOMA pan, which is, again, in and of itself, a, a great value as well. But uh, I've used this. I used it actually every month uh, for the Frugal Film Project one year. And Delivered every time. So I I've been very happy with this. And again, I can get it locally for somewhere in the vicinity of $5 and change for a roll for a 36 yeah. exposure roll. So can't That's beat good. that. Yeah, excellent. So my choice is, this is a, a film which a few years ago I used to make fun of. In fact, I've got a TikTok from two years ago where my daughter bought me this for Father's Day and I threw it in the bin because I was like, oh, I'm not a Portra <laughs> yeah. 400 dad. I'm a Kodak Color Plus dad. But you know what? I think I shot a couple of rolls years ago and wasn't that fussed on it. And then I've been shooting a lot of it lately, mostly probably the last 18 months, mostly because it's one of the only films we've had here in Australia available, uh, which is funny because in North America, apparently the stocks have been very low. Um, yeah. But I love this film now. I, I, it, it gives you great punchy colors, a bit of a retro vibe. There's Little definitely retro, grain yeah. there. It's not, um, you know, it's not Ektar or Portra 160, but I, I, I like that. I like knowing, yeah. looking at a, a, a photo and knowing that there's grain there. Uh, obviously, as long as it's not too crazy. But yeah, I, yeah. I really love this film. I've just bought uh, 12 rolls of this because I will be taking part in the Frugal Film Challenge, which is a good segue. I'll show you. I mean, you, I think you've already definitely already seen from my post in the group, but this is my yep. Frugal Film Project. Yeah. Um, 69.99 uh, Olympus Stylus Epic, thanks to my... Mike Razo and the FPP store and my color plus. Mm -hmm. What are you shooting for the FPP in 2024? So this year I, my film is uh, again, it's really just rebadged what I just showed you. This is uh, from Ribsy new classic, easy 400, oh, cool. which is widely believed to be a uh, foam 400 as well. Yep. But he had a sale uh, where he's basically, it was like a fire sale. He's getting, he's getting rid of all of his stock liquidating it. And I got this for four dollars and twenty one cents a roll. Wow! Uh, yeah, he was selling them in packs of five, so I ended up getting three five packs for a total of fifteen. I figured that would give me twelve months for the project, and then three to play with, which I've already shot a couple just to play with and have fun. My camera is going to be uh, a Canon Rebel Ti, nice. and I had this uh, third party lens on it is uh, a Yongno lens, and I got the lens for the lens with the expensive part. The lens was like forty five dollars off ebay so it's a used it's a nifty 50 it's a 50 millimeter uh f 1.8 and the camera um this is another great uh ebay find i got four canon rebel ti bodies for nine dollars so each <laughs> wow. camera was two dollars and 25 cents oh so my total investment was still under 50 bucks for the camera and the lens so that's gonna wow. be my companion for this year and i've actually already shot my january i went out on uh january 1st new year's yep. day and I've already shot the roll. I've already developed it. I've scanned it. I just need to uh, edit some of the dust and that kind of stuff out. So uh, I'm looking forward to this combo. Excellent. And does that lens man uh, autofocus with the camera or is it manual focus only? It's it's autofocus. Oh, yeah. wow. 
That's yeah, cool. I probably wouldn't have got it if it was manual focus. Yeah, the eye yeah. It used to be. <laughs> yeah, that's another thing. I mean, I think we touched upon this earlier, but I there's very few cameras now that I will use that I have to manually focus because of my eyes. So uh, yep. the ones I use are SX70, Olympus Pen yep. FT. There's probably yep. a couple others, but that's it. Like I just can't be doing with it anymore because it's just too hard to, to see. Yeah. Yeah, I do it occasionally too. I have a Helios uh, 44 2 lens that, that I have an adapter where I can use it on my Canon EOS, but again, it's manual focus. Yep. And then the other one that I would use more if it weren't manual focus is my Pentax 6 7 medium format. Oh, yeah. Uh, I've got it, you know, some, uh, I have only two two lenses for it, one of which is the the uh, 105, the 2.4, I think it is. Yep. Uh, great for portraits and that sort of thing, but uh, boy, you've got to be dead on with that focus. And I mean, when you nail it, it's fantastic. When yeah. you don't, it's not so hot so i don't use that as often but uh yeah i need to get out and shoot that more but again it's a challenge to nail that focus when you're trying to get that real narrow depth of field or bokeh yeah for sure so what is your best uh we'll go to now this be a best slr recommendation and this, this can be one you can pick up obviously a 90s or a 2000s or an 80s what's your best yeah. slr recommendation for for bang for buck so that's going to be uh again any of the Canon Rebel series. I actually have one, another one here. I've got, I can't tell you how many I have, probably too many, but I have a Canon Rebel T2, which nice. was the last of the Rebel series that were produced. So it's, you know, relatively recent. It's from the 2000s. So it's not like, you know, 30 years old. It's, it's, it's not as old. Uh, this one has the 40 millimeter pancake lens. Uh, and of course, as you're fond of saying, if you have the pancake lens on one of these rebel bodies, it's just like carrying around a point and shoot. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, I've lost track of the amount of times in uh, film photography groups, especially here in Australia. Someone will say, what's a good point and shoot? And pe two or three people will come on and, along and say, get a Canon EOS body with a 40 mil pancake. It's just like a point and shoot. And, and so some people have actually, I think Billy Sanford the other day, uh, I think it was Billy, uh, laughed and said, uh, people call it the Matt Murray special. Um, right. I, I actually drives me crazy when people say it's a point and shoot i mean it is for all intents and purposes but it's not a true point and shoot i right. I, I would agree with you 100 uh, percent. one of my my first serious camera when i got into photography was an eos i think it was a 300n uh, which is mm -hmm. the, sort of the same lineage as the kiss and the rebel they call them in north america yep. i think they're fantastic cameras they're not they're not beautiful sexy cameras like the 80s olympus or canon cameras or nikons but the eos cameras from the 90s and early 2000s were fantastic and that would definitely be my um, best slr recommend as well i don't actually have one at the moment um i had one a while ago and sold it but uh, i am keen to get another one what's your yeah. best secondhand point and shoot recommend yeah so if we're, right so if we're talking about uh you know fairly affordable well, there's a lot of great point and shoots out there uh you've got a bunch of them like you know you have a fuji you have like the the class you have one Classes, of the class ones. yeah 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 which the class those are fantastic i don't have one uh, cause I'm too cheap to buy one, but, uh, and I do have a couple, like I have one here. This is the, uh, Olympus stylus Epic. Nice. This one has the panoramic on it. And this is the, um, not one of the zooms, but this is like the original prime one, yep. but this is not a frugal camera anymore. These cost too much. Now, I, of course I got mine cheap years and years ago. So I would go with, um, a couple different kinds I can think of. I am fond of kind of the unsung heroes here. This is a Minolta Freedom. This is Minolta, Minolta Freedom Escort. Um, pretty good lens on this thing. Mm -hmm. And again, I got this. I did get this at a thrift store about three years ago. It was uh, under three bucks. Wow. So and that doesn't happen that often these days. As you know, thrift stores, at least I don't know how it is in Australia, but here in the US, yeah. it kind of dried up. But um, don't sleep on the Minolta Freedom series. They're, again, not 60 cameras. It's not a Yashica T4. It's not one of these Olympus ones. But very capable, very easy to use. Uh, if I have one that was maybe a runner up, I uh, grabbed another one here, which is a Nikon Light Touch AF. Oh, yeah. Yep. This is also, I think, AF600. I think it's known in some markets. Uh, super thin. I mean, look at the profile mm. on that. I mean, it's super thin, very lightweight, has the fake panoramic on. It's got a little switch on the back. You can do that if you want to, which I kind of yeah. do every once in a while. I haven't shot this in a while. It's a 3.5 uh, 3 lens, 28 millimeters. So not as wide as the ultra wide and slim, but still a little wider than usual. So you want to keep those fingers out of the way and hold the frame. it from the top. Yep. Uh, yep. But this one, again, another solid choice. I, I enjoy shooting this one too. Cheap. Excellent. My my choice would be the uh, B1 that I picked up for $10 from Facebook Marketplace, which is what, six bucks, 650 American. So this is the uh, Canon. I, I'm a big fan of the Canon um, 
fixed sort of lens uh, point and shoots from the 80s and early 90s. So this is the Canon Sure Shot Tele. It has two uh, two lenses in there. So it's not a zoom. Yeah. It's got the two lenses that go in and out. It's got a soft focus yep. filter for those 80s glamour shots. It takes multi exposures. <laughs> it's got a date back. Um, yeah, I mean, they're not $10 most of the time anymore, but that would definitely be um, my choice. I was very close to, to picking this for the Frugal Film Project, but it's a, yeah. it's a little bit chunky and I'm, uh, I'm going, I'm actually going to China for eight days with my dad and my nephew and my uncle on a, a, oh, a cool. very cheap, um, very cheap, like uh, package holiday they all booked. And I was like, yeah, I'm in as well. Um, so um, yeah, it's going to be cold cold in china i think in march so um but i'm i'm, I'm taking the the olympus uh stylus epic with me for my frugal shots for oh. march so hopefully i get some good hopefully i pick Great. up some good chinese shots and, and i don't get any pick up any chinese <laughs> viruses or anything like that over there yeah yeah <laughs> <hopefully. Christ. laughs> now what's the most exciting product that you've seen in the film photography space uh since your channel started five years ago oh it's been a lot of st that's happened in five years um well, we talked about one already, the Harman Phoenix 200. That was kind of a big deal. And again, it, it does have a weird look to it. It's not, a, it, Harman came out and said this, it's an experimental film. It's not a perfect film. Um, but I think a lot of people are excited by the prospect of it. Uh, another one I could think of is the return. So it's not really a new product per se, but uh, the Loma Chrome Turquoise. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. I never got to shoot the original Same. flavor. It was out years ago. So I don't know Mario Piper. Uh, he's yeah. a big he loves yeah. that film. He, he, he shot the, the OG, the original one. Uh, quite a few rolls of it but when that came out that was a big deal and uh, people have been clamoring for it i think you know lamography heard the noise and chatter and they just said you know what let's pull the trigger and do it so yeah that was an exciting one uh if i had to say camera news uh one that i have actually this i was excited to get this one this is the lomo apparat oh yes it, yeah uh, it's a fun one you know not super frugal but it's about 90 bucks i think this was 100 because it had the fancy orange leather yeah. or whatever but it's got little accessories with the two so you've got like a kaleidoscope lens it just fits on the top here nice. uh, it's got a splitzer so you can take funny oh yeah, 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 yeah. And, and do that kind of thing so um this one again not as frugal as some of the other ones we talked about but still under 100 dollars. brand new camera it's got little uh filters you can use for the flash you can do like color flash and that sort of thing so I was excited to get this. I've shot several rolls with it and uh, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Is that like zone focus or fixed focus or? It's fixed focus. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's it's fixed focus. So again, it's three feet, it's anything from three feet onwards. Yeah. Is it, or? Yeah, That's yeah, the same great. idea. Yep. Awesome. So they actually do make a photo for this one that is, you can focus a little bit closer. Oh, cool. So that just, again, slides right over the lens here and you can get uh, as close as I believe eight inches. So it gets real close. Yeah. It's funny. Um, I've got these filters. I'll show you these. Uh, I was talking to, I think it was, oh, it was ages ago. I think it was, uh, I think it was Ed Conde. And I was talking about filters um, for my, my contacts point and shoot. And he actually said, oh, get the, um, get the Lomo filters. They're actually the same size. So yeah. I've got a box of, I mean, I do the, I don't know if you do this, Dave, but this is a box of completely unopened, never used Lomo uh, instant filters um and they are the same size uh to fit the contax t3 which is a very expensive camera wow and i've never used them but i i should have i should have used them but i haven't but that was a good tip a, a good thing yeah. you know lomo make these really cool accessories and cool little filters yep. and um you've, you've definitely got me interested in the apparat there from your your little uh, uh mini yeah. sales not that it was a sales pitch but it, it's uh it, it no, it's does fun. sound intriguing it's i think if you like the uh the ultra wide and slim i think you'd like this too yeah. Plus it has a flash on it, so you can take indoor shots and again, awesome. all the filters and that sort of thing. So it's uh, it's a fun one. Excellent. Now, what is the, uh, I've got to show you mine. My, my favorite pro, uh, product since, you know, the last few years has been this uh, Adox Color Mission film. Uh, new color film, pretty grainy, very, you know, uh, sort of uh, minimal exposure latitude. You can't under or overexpose it a lot. But I was really excited about that. And I really love the roles that I've shot with it. Have you shot Adox Color Mission? Uh, I haven't because I think you bought all the stock yourself. I'm pretty sure. Uh, isn't that one that you, you really loaded up on that one? I think you distributed I, to other people. Though, yeah, you? I got 20 rolls um, because the shipping to Australia was like, I can't remember how much it was, 30 or 40 euros. If you bought one roll or 20, it was 30, 40 euros. So oh, I bought that right. and I, um, a few people in Sydney, friends in Sydney, I think Bill too got some, Lucy Lumen got some. I can't remember who else yep. got some now, but uh, I think I sold just over half of my rolls and I've, I think I've shot okay. six or seven rolls. I've still got about three left. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a fun film. 
Yeah, I think you shot that for some of your very early uh, YouTube videos, if I recall. That was my first one or two. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, yeah and I, I thought you got great results with it. So it looks like an interesting film, but that is not one I've shot yet. Now we've spoken about um, sort of the, the best brand new, you know, more cheaper cameras you can buy, and you know, frugal choices for film and stuff like that. But one thing we haven't spoken about is the brand new Pentax camera. Now, recently, yes. probably about three days ago, we have a film photography podcasters chat, and there was a lot of chat in there from all the podcasters about the camera and how much mm -hmm. it should cost. I think Mike Gutterman, I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, but Mike Gutterman said, look, if it's not under $250, no one's going to buy it. And then Theo and me and some other people said, well, it's it's going to be, I would say it's going to be over $250 US mm -hmm. because of, it, it's it's got to cost more than that. Uh, right. you know, what's your take on it? How much it should cost? Will you buy it? Do you think it'll be a hit? Yeah, so I do. Th I agree with you. I can't see it being under two hundred fifty dollars. Just be, you know, they we've all heard about the R and D that's gone into this. Uh, so I think it's going to be at least three hundred, maybe more. I don't know. We'll see. That's these are <laughs> these are conjecture. This is all conjecture. We don't know. We're yeah. not, we're not on the inside, you know, tone giving people the scoop. But I do envision it being more than two fifty. Uh, I do think people will pay that or some people will. I don't know if I will just because, again, my shelves over here, as I've referenced before, I've got 150 some cameras roughly. Yep. Uh, do I need another one? I don't need another one. Uh, do I like the idea of supporting uh, Rico slash Pentax and what they're doing? I do like that idea. So it's not outside of the realm of possibility that I will support them and, and get it. Uh, I think there will be a, a pretty big base of support because people are hungry for uh, a new camera although it's a little disingenuous when people say oh you know nobody's released a new film camera in years you know lomo's been doing it they haven't yeah. quit and yeah. so but this is it's supposed to be a different a different style of camera different maybe a different class of camera but if you embrace the lo-fi aesthetic uh, again lomography hasn't gone anywhere they've been doing this for you know years uh the other extreme of course you have you know like every yeah. the uh, what m6 i think it was uh and that kind of took off, you know, it was certainly not an inexpensive uh, camera, but I, I heard something, you know, their sales have been very solid for that. Mm. So there are, I think, plenty of people out there to support um, buying a new film camera. Again, I think it is going to depend on the cost for me as to whether or not I'm going to support it personally. Um, do you see yourself buying it or is it, is it more cost dependent on you? Like do you want to see what the price point is at or how do you feel about it, Matt? I'm very excited about it. Um, one of the things I said in the, this group chat was that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of surprised that they're branding at Pentax because Rico have a better a pedigree with more compact cameras like the GR series, the R GR, series. Yep. So yep. it's it's kind of weird that it's a, being branded from Pentax because Pentax cameras were a little bit chunkier other than say the um, Pentax SBO Mini. Um, right. I'm excited about it. I think it's kind of odd in a way they're using a, a manual lever to wind the film on. I mean, I think it's cool, um, but that's, yeah. it's an interesting point. I would have to I would have to look at the specs and the price point. I would say that I'm more likely to buy it than not just because I'm excited about it. Um, if it's if it comes out and it's more like the ultra wide and slim specifications, maybe not. But I think if it's a good mid range brand new camera with a warranty, I think yep. I'd probably be more likely to buy it. And they have said quite a few times, you know, they're pitching this at young people. They want young people to afford it and use it. That's clearly their market. Yep. Um, I in a way. You, you would think it would cost up to a thousand US dollars, but then again, given all this talk about young people, you'd actually think it's probably going to maybe gravitate more towards the 500 US dollar 500. mark. That, I envision that more. I can't, I, I think some probably over 250, probably 500, less than 500 or right yep. at that price point is my guess. For me, it's going to depend on probably two factors. I already mentioned price. Uh, the other thing is kind of what you said, specs or more specifically the lens. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. The lens is on it. Yeah, so, that's right. Because we'll if you wouldn't want to spend that money on a camera you've, and you've already got ones on your shelf, do the same thing. But if it's a little bit different, a little bit special, if it's got a nice right. design, I mean, these are all factors that could sway. It definitely pushed me. I mean, I'm about 85% yes, but mm -hmm. these are all factors. We'll have to wait and see. So uh, hopefully that'll we'll hear more about that this year. I have got a game okay. now, though. I've got a game to finish off. So I'm about to show Dave, for all the podcast listeners, uh, I'm about to show Dave 10 thumbnails from his videos over the last five years. And... On each of the thumbnails, he's put some text there, which sort of describes the film, but I've covered over that with a picture of Dave and the old camera guy, YouTube. So he can't, he can't just read it and tell what it is. So here comes the first one. I'm putting this in the chat and I'll overlay this on the video for YouTube people. Dave, what is this film? Uh, what is that film? Hmm. It's black and white. That's uh, right. Hmm. 
and it's at a fair, so that only narrows it down to about 25 videos because <laughs> I always <laughs> I shoot affairs all the time. Um, I'm going to guess that that might be maybe new classic easy 400. It looks like it could, it looks sort of foma panish, or maybe it's one of the variations. Ooh, well, ac according to my sources, this is Fuji Film Across 2, part of your $5 film project series. Is that no, that's incorrect. No, I'm, really? I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> I oh, believe you. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. As I zoom in, as I'm looking closer at it, yeah, the grain is probably too fine to be one of the foma pans. So if you say it, I'll believe you. Okay, good, good. I hope, I hope I haven't got any of these wrong. Okay, here is the next one. Oh, that is an easier one because it's got those weird green orbs. Yep. That is a Revolog film. I'm going to search the memory banks and say that is Volvox. Correct. Excellent. Well done. Oof. Got got some runs on the board. I'm feeling a bit better now. <laughs> okay, we're, go we're going to go for this one now. This one's going to be easy as well. I've shot this film as well a few years ago. Let's see. Oh, that is uh, Psych Blues. Correct. Correct. And yeah. I've got another easy I one for you now. You you'll know this one straight away. I hope and so. There was no uh, text to cover over with this one. So beautiful motel scene there with some neon signs and beautiful colors. And Easy I remember that motel because it was the literally the sleaziest motel I've ever stayed in. That is Sinisto 800T. Correct. Excellent. You're doing three out of four there. That first one really stumped okay. you, but you're, you're not doing too bad now. Okay. So we're going to keep on going. We've got six more. We'll see if you can get a pass mark here. I've got, I've got to choose the right <laughs> file here. Which one? No, oh, file. the pressure's on. Okay. It, it is. Okay. Here's this one. I, I reckon you'll get this one as well. So this one's got like a water tank and some old buildings here. Yeah. So judging by that weird desaturation, I'm going to go with uh, Lomochrome Metropolis. Correct. Excellent. Well okay. done. Now we've got another fairground one coming up. Uh-oh. Uh, I, I think this ones. one's not too bad though. Here it is. I think you you'll know this one. There's like a nice Ferris wheel with lovely colors there, looking up to the sky. Oh yeah. So hmm. I want to say that that might be one of your favorite films. It looks like it could be Kodak Color Plus. Correct. Yes. Very well done. <laughs> and now the next one. Is a picture of some green grass, blue sky, and some old sort of brick building by the look of it. Oh, yeah. So I remember where that building is, too. It's in Pataskla, which is about a half hour from where I live. And it's an old schoolhouse that's uh, seen better days, long abandoned. That, I think, judging by those greens, sure looks like a Fuji variant of some sort. I think it's Fuji uh, 400, whatever the one that was that, that they got rid of. Yep. The Fuji uh, Film Pro 400H. Right, H. That's yep. it. Well done. Excellent. Okay, we're in the home stretch now. We've got a couple of black and white ones coming up here. Oh, that's my downfall right there, the black and <laughs> white ones. They're a little bit harder to tell, hey, so especially from the small images in the chat. So this one here is like, of like a mattress and some buildings and some, uh, yeah, some trees yes. and stuff in the background. That one, uh, I'm going to say to me, even though you have, you've covered every part of the mattresses there with my beautiful mug there, uh, I'm going to go with Sinistel BWXX Ooh, or well double X. done. Yes, very good. Well done. Now, let's see if you can get this next one. This one features an image of some kind of old, is it a fire engine from, I'm sorry, my eyes are so bad. I can't even see where it is, but is it a, let's have a look. Uh, it oh. is, oh no, it's just like an old truck with a crane or something yeah. on top. Or? Yeah, that is an old truck. Now, I remember where that truck is. That is in the Hocking Hills, which is a beautiful, re beautiful region, more like Southeast Ohio about an hour from where I live. Mm -hmm. uh, I cannot for the life of me know what that film is though. It's black and white, so that narrows it down. Uh, and I'm trying to think what kind of film I would have shot there. I'm trying to use my deductive reasoning and it's failing me miserably. <laughs> so we'll go with, it's not a Kodak film, I don't think, because Kodak films, the black and whites curl too much on me. So we're yep. gonna rule out Kodak. Um, could be maybe, let's go with, Ilford FP4 Plus. Yes, correct. Well done. Oh, lucky guess. Okay. Yeah. Is there a, is there an F, is FP4 FP4 Plus is it the same thing? Uh, I, I don't know. Did I say okay. plus? I think is it plus? I don't know. I don't know, but you, you're it's right. FP4. FP4. I, don't I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not, as four. you know, I'm not a big black and white shooter, so I was just trying to ask you that for my own knowledge. Yeah, and I don't, but, I don't shoot a lot of that film. When I shoot yeah. Ilford black and white, it's usually uh, HP5 plus. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, no, that that's right. one of my good. If I'm just shooting, I just want to go out and shoot something black and white. Yep. Again, in Ohio, a lot of, a lot of gray skies. 400 speed film is king. So yep. uh, FP5 is great, great film. Love it. Yep. 
correct that, Jed. So are, are we on? You've only got one wrong. Is that correct? Uh yeah. The very first one you stumped me on. Okay, so this is the this is the very last one. So this one features an image of the sea. Uh, mm. well, I think it's a sea. Maybe it's um, maybe it's is it a lake or the sea? No, it's the sea. But look of it with some kind of lighthouse. Mm, we'll see. Uh, nice, beautiful colors. Oh, I think the beautiful colors might give me this one. Uh, that that red lighthouse almost has to be Kodak Ektar 100. Correct. So you okay. got off to a disastrous start, but you, yes. you, geez, you, you know, you come home with the goods there. Nine out of 10. I think you've acquitted yourself very well. Uh, All right. So how do you feel about your performance there, Dave? You know, nine out of 10, I'll take it. Excellent. So Dave's got uh, almost 300 videos on YouTube, past the 1 million views uh, some time ago, and it's probably powering on to towards 2 million now. Thank you so much for being a, a guest on my podcast and YouTube. I've really enjoyed the chat and uh, I look forward to more of your content. Is there any, can you give yourself a shout out with all of your, your channels? Yeah. So it's pretty easy to remember the old camera guy pretty much everywhere. My main platform is uh, YouTube. Uh, I do have a presence on Instagram as well. Again, the old camera guy. Uh, TikTok, I don't really do anything there. Flickr, I don't really do anything there. Uh, Twitter slash X, guess what? I'm the old camera guy there and I don't do anything either there. So if you want to find me, uh, look for YouTube, the old camera guy and Instagram. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dave. And uh, hopefully I'll chat to you again another time. Thanks, mate. This is a lot of fun. Appreciate it.